540307A, the end time. Phoenix, Arizona, USC. Good afternoon, friends, to all of you. Very glad to be here this afternoon and to see a gallant faith in Christ. Come out and set in a hot building. Maybe it may not seem hot to you people, but when others' blood are very thick, it sure is hot. And I, been having a little, by Sharit, said that quote now. It's a little old thin alpaca cotton. It's just merely my shirt. It's just all about all it is. I said, I sweat like everything in this. So I, now he said, well, it don't seem very hot here to the natives, I suppose, because you're used to it. But I'm so happy to be here. But the more was just telling me that they had taken a love offering for missionary work to be given over to me for missionary work. I thank, I thank you. May God bless you. I just don't know how to say it. I, it's just something about missionary that I just, I just love it. And I know that what you're doing, you're doing God's will when you give to missions. That is right. It's not fair that one person hear the gospel twice when somebody hasn't heard it once. See, everybody should hear the gospel at least once. And I want to do my part to try to take the gospel to everybody that I know how, every place. And I used to earn the difference of the remunerations of the meeting and what I'd left over, I'd give it to charity organization and so forth. Well, now I have nothing at all against them at all. And I think they all find every one of them from the Salvation Army and the Volunteers of America, the Red Cross, polio drives, and many of those things. It's good to give to those things. But I thought the people that come to my meeting are people who are usually poor people and they're interested in the kingdom of God. Well, much of the world of the people, of the common run of the people that doesn't go to church, businessmen and so forth, write checks for them, drives and so forth for thousands and thousands of dollars, while well, a poor missionary suffers with a lack. After all, we know that we like to see everybody well. We like to see people that's hungry be fed. But you know, the soul is the most important thing of anything in the mortal, because that's the thing that lasts forever. And I, and you know, when I believe that every Christian is obligated to be a missionary. I believe every Christian is obligated. Now, not so much as you have to go over in our countries and preach or something, but if you can't go, you can help send somebody else, you see. See, what you do to send somebody else. And did you ever think what Jesus said about when the disciples asked him when he will return again? Why? He said, show us a sign that when he would return. He said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. That'll be right. You'll hear of fathers against mothers and mothers against and parents against children and so forth. But that's not yet. He said, there'll be a time where they'd be all different and eat the morals. They'd marry and give in marriage and so forth. It's not yet. But he said, when this gospel is preached to all the world, then he'd return. And where have we done, Christian friends? We have failed miserably. Is that right? I am. If you'd only followed me in the last eight years since I've been in Phoenix, the last time, and to see what I've seen, and to see little hungry children in the streets, little colored boys in Africa, and little girls drink from a muddy stream, the only water they ever know, and then maybe get chomped up by the crocodile while they're drinking. Never knew what a bath was, never knew the name of Jesus Christ, and nothing else, never eat at a table in their life, find anything out in their fields just full of maggots, they eat maggots and all. So they, that's all they know to eat. I was talking to a doctor here not long ago, two or three doctors standing in the sporting goods place, where a man who ran a safari in Africa was wanting to know if he'd pay my way if I'd go down with him in a hunting trip. They're going down on Triple W A. I said, I'm not going there to hunt. I'm going to hunt for souls for Jesus Christ. And I was telling him about the native life. He said, well, Reverend Branham, he said, you understand those people are? That's not human. I said, I beg your pardon, doctor. They're just as much human as you are, or I am. That's right. He said, oh, they couldn't be. I said, what the question come up about? I said, has all of our hygiene helped us any? If one of us would eat something like that, we'd die before night. But he ate it and it don't hurt him. You don't find the, half the sickness among them that we find among us. We got some kind of medicine and it might help something and cause us to have something else. See, I just wonder if it's helped us any. I believe we'd be pretty as well off if it just went the way God told us to in the first place. See, I'm not condemning that now. 
No, but watch, it shortens the days up. Why? There's an old colored lady sitting there, claim she'd had David Livingston preach. She'd have to be 130, 35 years old, see? And there, think of that. This doctor said they're not human. I said they're just as much human as we are. I said, doctor, you have tried for the last 6,000 years to get one matter out the closest animals to the human race, which is a chimpanzee. I said, you have tried to get one matter out of him, but you can't. He just absolutely can't think. And he, there's nothing about him. There's no soul in him. But I said, give me a little bushman. That's a wildest tribe in Africa. Bring me a little bushman. His great, 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 great grandfather never even seen a white man or civilization. The little boy don't know which is right and left hand. He don't know which day of the week it is or no nothing. Only thing he knows is get what he can eat. That's all he knows. Let me have him when he's six months old and come visit him when he's 10 years old. He can read, write, and anything else. He's a human and just Christ died for him. And we're here on the churches in these big cities and things, great, big, fine churches and all this stuff and about a little handful of people and stewing around like that and the millions that has never heard of Jesus Christ. That's right. Oh, that's a pity. Somebody get a vision and go that go to those just said go into all the world and preach the gospel now what they want to know over there is the gospel just not the word but the power and demonstration of the holy spirit i met them coming to the meeting there packing my idols sprinkled with blood coming down the street the mayor of Durban, city smith was bringing out where we the streets and hills and things were so packed with people and he said i said look at those fellows with their idols and what's that tag they got hanging around their neck the christians i said what with an idol he said yeah they pack idols too and I said, well, that's strange. I said, could you speak his language? That fellow standing there said, yes, he's a Zulu. And I went over to him and I asked him. He couldn't speak English, of course. I said, you're a Christian. Yep, he's a Christian. And I said, well, what you packing that idol for? Oh, he said, his daddy packed it. And now he said, one day the lion got after his daddy and he set the little idol down and built up a fire and said, the little enchantment that the witch doctor told him, and the lion ran away. said, well, if Amoya filled, that's God, the unseen. The word means the wind, the Amoya. We, they say we pray to the unseen force, like the wind. If he fills, this won't fill. Now, you know that's not Christianity, not at all. Well, I said, being a hunter myself, the lion, the prayer that you said never ran the lion away. That never scared the lion. The fire you built up ran the lion away. See, it got scared of the fire. But that afternoon, when they seen the Lord Jesus Christ in his power of his resurrection, when there come a man across the platform, the first one on the platform at Durban was a little a Mohammedan woman. She had a red dot between her eyes. There's perhaps missionary setting here now that knows what that means. They've been to the temple. They've been blessed by the priest, a rejection of Jesus Christ, and accepting the Mohammedan. When she stood on the platform, we had about 15 interpreters, and so the different 15 languages, just as far as you could see, for city blocks was people just everywhere. And then they were laying there naked in all kinds of conditions, different tribes. They had them first off, so the tribes wouldn't war at one another. And the missionaries and so forth that brought them in from way out in the jungles, they said they come in for two weeks. I thought, You'd say a long time or be there for a long time. It was only there for three days. And then in that afternoon, the first woman came across the platform. I said, of course, you know, I couldn't heal you, the interpreter. But I said, you couldn't hide your life. I said, then why, as you as a Mohammedan, why have you come to me as a Christian? She said to the interpreter, of course, I believe she believed that I could help her. I said, but why? Why don't you go to your priest at the temple? No, she wanted me to help her. I said, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. She believed Jesus Christ too, but not to be the son of God. She just, the Mohammedans, that's Israel's children, see, they believe in God, but they don't believe Jesus to be the son of God. They say Mohammed was a prophet of God. They ring this great big gong every morning. The priest comes out and he hollers, there's one true living God in Mohammed is prophet. 
we believe there's one true living God in Christ is the Son, see? So then we, then they told her, then the Holy Spirit come and begin to speak to her and told her that who her husband was, what his name was, spoken in Mohammedan, and told him where he was at the day before there, and what he done to his wife and what doctor she went to. And then Mohammedans out there begin to scream Krishna, I say incarnated God, because they had me say Christ. So the incarnation of Krishna, they thought it was that. So you have to watch that. I said, no, I never said Krishna, and I'm not Krishna, I'm a servant of Christ, not Krishna. So they had to let it go through the interpreters again. And then the woman, she bowed down, took, her skirts was hanging down, wiped the red dot from between her eyes and became a Christian. So then, that's strange for Mohammedan. So then, went off the platform. The next one coming was a white woman. And she came, told her where she was at, what was wrong with her, just assist on ovary. But said, prepare for death, for you're not going to live, but just a little bit. A Christian. Now, if I'd have been a healer, I would have healed the woman. Many times I've seen death on people this last week, but I never said anything about it, because prayer could change it. But not this time. God had said it at the funeral procession, and I know it was over. And I said, prepare for death, for you're not going to live, but a little bit. She said, how do you know that? I said, well, the same one that knowed what was wrong with you. She just done like that and walked off the platform, sat down, and in about 10 minutes, she dropped dead right there. They took her away. See, I couldn't. If I'd have been the healer now, I'd have healed her. But I can only see what he tells me to see, see?